I was very basic in my approach. I actually wrote a list and it was titled People to Contact. And I wrote a list of everybody that I thought would come to my funeral. That sounds a little bit dark, but I wrote that list because I thought you only go to someone's funeral usually if you like them. And so I took that approach and I came up with about 75 names. And I wrote them a letter and said, after 20 years in banking, I've moved into real estate. And if I can ever help you with any advice, buying, selling, renting, leasing, moving, give me a call. Within a couple of days, I started getting some text messages and some people just took a photo of the letter and said, good on you, mate, go for it. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of elite agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers and leaders. With thanks to our partner, Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking and strategies to elevate your results. To download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links and shortcuts, visit EliteAgentElevate.com. And for more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier on your clients, Visit connectnow.com.au. Here is your host, Samantha McLean. Welcome to another episode of the Elevate Podcast, where we delve into some of the most interesting minds in business and in real estate for the very best tips and strategies for you to implement to elevate your business. I'm Samantha McLean, editor of Elite Agent and host of today's show. Today I'm joined by Jason Roach, who's clocked up some pretty impressive successes as an agent, auctioneer, and principal after making the transition from the banking sector. So after joining the real estate industry in 2014, Jason quickly achieved double Centurion status with Century 21 and more recently became a property partner with the agency. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks, Samantha. Great to be here. It was really interesting to meet up with you because you've had such an interesting path into real estate, a far from conventional path. So after 20 years of enjoying a very successful career in the banking sector, you decided to move over and become an agent. So Tell us a little bit about what you were doing. It was with Macquarie originally, wasn't it? That's it. So I spent uh, 15 years at Macquarie Bank and then moved to Westpac. Much of that time was banking small businesses and most of that time was banking real estate agents, financing rent rolls, getting to understand their business, trust banking, all that sort of stuff. So I got to know some of the best in the industry and I've been able to use a lot of those as mentors as part of my transition from what I call my sort of fat, cosy corporate environment to (laughs) actually working for a living now in real estate and I love it. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Real estate is such a tough business to be in. How did you find your first days, weeks, months actually in the real estate world for real? Yeah, so reality hit home really quick. I knew it was going to be hard, but I had some good foundations in some good training. And as I say, some really great mentors who kind of kept egging me on and, and, and picking me up. But I was very basic in my approach. I actually wrote a list and it was titled People to Contact. And I wrote a list of everybody that I thought would come to my funeral. And that sounds a little bit dark, but I wrote that list because I thought you only go to someone's funeral usually if you like them. So I took that approach and I came up with about 75 names and I wrote them letters. I literally didn't handwrite it, but everyone was individually addressed. And I wrote him a letter and said, after 20 years in banking, I've moved into real estate. If I can ever help you with any advice, buying, selling, renting, leasing, moving, give me a call. And within a couple of days, I started getting some text messages. And some people just took a photo of the letter and said, good on you, mate, go for it. I'm in your corner. That kind of became the genesis of my database. And then I just followed the best practice of what I learned through different media on YouTube and training and all the great trainers that we enjoy. Yeah. Success leaves clues, doesn't it? Sure does, yeah. Some, some people um, spend so long reinventing the wheel when really you could just keep it simple, go to a few good mentors. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. So I worked on, just worked on sort of some basic principles. I found in my business banking career to move banks from bank A to bank B, it's not very convenient to do it, so it's really got to be worth it. And I thought about when a potential vendor is selling their house, it's a bit of a pain to sell your house unless you really have to do it or you really want to do it and you're really motivated to do it. So I kind of tried to program myself to say, Jace, be patient because these people need time. So you need to, to compensate for the few number of transactions that I was likely to do. I needed to have a really big pipeline and to have a really big pipeline, I need to be talking to a lot of people. So it was really sort of a, just the guiding principles, be patient, follow the process, believe in yourself. And don't be too hard on yourself. Be kind to yourself, as a friend of mine said to me recently. Good advice. It's good advice for 2020 for sure. Yeah. Do you remember your first listing? Sure do. How did that feel when you won your first one? There's an interesting story to this, actually, because I'm currently selling the people that I sold for my very first listing, I'm currently selling for them again. 
I remember saying to them when they called me and said, Jace, we want you to sell our house. Well, that was actually an apartment in the northern suburbs of Sydney. And I said, you know, I've only just started doing this. And they said, that's okay, we trust you. And that statement they said to me, it really filled me with sort of like a bit of a, a guiding path because this is all about trust. If someone, if they like you, that's great. You know, that's step one, but they've got to trust you. And to trust you, they've got to believe that you understand the process and that sort of thing. So I still remember that listing. It was in Nola Road, Roseville. And as I say, I'm currently selling for those people again. We go to auction in 10 days' time. Amazing. What are the main skills you think that you learned during your many years in banking that have translated into real estate to allow people to just go, oh, I trust you? It's probably being able to read the play. So what people are telling you, be they a seller or a buyer, what they're telling you about their circumstances and why they want to buy or why they want to sell, that's not always the case. And so sometimes you need to almost look over their shoulder. I'm looking over your shoulder at the moment, Samantha. You need to look behind them and say, what's really going on? What's causing them to want to buy or want to sell? Because it's a pretty big deal. So it's really sort of having the patience to ask the right questions and knowing when to shut up. Yeah. Well, you learn that in corporate meetings, and don't you? Completely. <laughs> yeah. People do it on Zoom now that it's put mute, but it's different. So reading the play and really being, I think, a good reader of people and showing a fair bit of empathy and that first urge to open your mouth when someone says something, don't, don't go for it. Don't take the bait that the brain is giving you. Just hold the silence and listen for probably five seconds longer and you might learn a bit more. Mm. I usually find five seconds is what people need to continue an answer to. Pretty much, yeah. And five seconds is a really long time. Yeah, especially when no one's talking. Yeah. Absolutely. So you started at Century 21 yeah. and within a year you'd opened your own agency in Linfield. You just mentioned Roseville. Yeah. Linfield's the next suburb over yeah. in Sydney with a view to building it from scratch. So how did you know you were ready for that and what was that experience like? I probably wasn't ready. I don't think you're ever really ready to start your own business. The experience was pretty challenging and it's still challenging. I guess the, probably the most challenging thing was being willing to let go. Obviously, recruiting well was a challenge and is a challenge. That's the same in any business. But then it's a bit, being able to recruit well and delegate and train and grow the people around you. And I've had mixed success at that. I've done okay with some and not okay with others. That's probably been the biggest challenge. And it's funny, through COVID, where I started my business, I was actually back there again. You know, we were back there again in March, April. Like, so, you know, when we closed the office, we're still open for business. And it gave me the realisation of sort of there was a bit of a get back to fundamentals here, Jace, like just pick up the phone and make more calls because you can't get belly to belly with people. Or most people aren't cool with that at the moment. This is going back six months. There was a bit of a lesson. Tom, Tom Panos, he made a post this morning on Instagram that talked about COVID clarity. And you know, what's the gift that comes wrapped in, might, might come, what does he say, badly wrapped? Badly wrapped, Badly yeah. wrapped, but yeah. it's, um, there's some real truths in that. It's um, quite grounding. Well, it is definitely. I think there's been some amazing resilience shown by the industry this year, for sure. All, all the things that we didn't know we could do, we've actually been able to do, like working remotely and, absolutely, yeah, you know, remote inspections and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Are there any of those things that you relied heavily on during that period of lockdown? Probably communication. Like, you know, you've got to talk to your vendors multiple times a day, be it through the phone or, or perhaps an email or, a, or an SMS, probably doing it sort of almost more frequently and making sure that they're in line. Because if you're not in line, then you're going to get off track in terms of a, getting an outcome that everybody wants. Same with staff, you know, making sure we were checking in with staff and making sure that you know, I don't run a big team. I tried to have a big team and it didn't really work very well. So I've scaled myself back. There's only four of us now. But just checking in with people and making sure, you know, see, seeing how they're feeling, making sure they've got the resources. You know, as a small business owner, it was actually challenging to make sure everybody had the right resources they needed at home. Mm. Because coming from an, a corporate environment where I was many years ago, you just push a button or click your fingers and something would happen. Nothing happens anymore unless I do it or I'm able to delegate to do it. Probably the lesson was around communication and making sure that people are feeling okay. And if they're not feeling okay, at least they're aware of what's going on and why we're doing something or why we're not doing something. Yeah. It's really interesting, actually. So you just said you've scaled back recently and you've got four people in your team. And there's an interest, like, you know, because you and I were talking off air and I'm from a corporate background as well. And, and in the corporate world, you have definite leaders and then you have definite people that work for you, you know, yeah. particularly if you're running a sales team. And in the real estate industry, it's a bit interesting because you've got leaders who are salespeople as well as salespeople working for you. How do you manage that dynamic in, in your business? And is it a little bit strange for you to be selling with other people as a leader? I like being on the tools. So not really. I enjoy it. Before I left the corporate environment, my boss said to me, Jace, get off the tools, stop doing deals. And I said to him, I'm good at it and I like it. And that's not to say I'm not sort of pumping my own tyres by saying that, but that's 
one of the reasons I probably enjoy real estate. It's really hard work, but if you lead from the front, you know, most battlefield commanders are leading at the front. They're not leading from the rear. I think real estate is also, because of the, the size of the dollars we're talking about, the, the amount of money involved, all clients need to see that there is a, a strong direction of the strategy and the approach to get the right outcome. And it's not a sit back and just point business. It's just not like that. It's, it is hands on. It's still very, I call it meat and potatoes. You know, you've got to get in there and get amongst it. And, you know, no, nothing's better than, for example, working the auction floor. I love working the auction floor. It, yeah. it, sometimes it scares the heck out of me, but I think if you're feeling nervous or you're a bit feeling a bit sort of um, wary, that probably means you care. Yeah, absolutely. Do you still get nervous before an auction? Sure. Yep. Yep. How do you calm your nerves? Just wait. The, au- <laughs> the auction will start eventually. <laughs> two will pass. Pretty much. Pretty much. I had an auction two weeks ago in Linfield. I had a ton of people through it and the, the interest just wasn't popping and I thought, I've got to, I've got to run this to auction to force the buyer's hand. And I had three registrations. I had someone, to an opener. He opened the bidding for me and then he bid against himself four times and we sold it. So that wouldn't have happened without sort of following a process of running an auction and the fear of it not being successful. I think that's really important is just because if you run an auction and you don't sell it, that's not ideal, but it doesn't mean you failed. It means you've actually been brave enough to push the process doesn't mean you take every property to auction if the circumstances don't dictate, but you've got to follow the process and sometimes you've got to make sure the market knows that you're in charge of the sale because the vendor has an expectation of you seen working really hard for them. But you know what? There's the next listing that's standing in the living room next to you from the guy around the corner who's about to sell his house in two months' time. You're being interviewed as that's happening. And I've had some calls off that auction where people said, so Jace, let me get this right. You had an auction at Linfield last week. Yep. And that guy bid against himself. He kept bidding. I said, yeah. He said, what did you say to him? I said, just keep bidding. I'm not going to give away my secret source. There is no secret source. Anybody who runs an auction company, there is no secret source. It's really just asking the question to get the, the answers you want, really. There's been a bit of a trend around Sydney for the last 12 to 18 months off market or off portal or someone's thinking about selling. And where do you sit in that? Do you believe that the off market trend will continue into 2021? Or do you think that it is better to take the property through to auction? Oh, look, I'd like to take every property to auction. But sometimes if you don't need to broadly advertise the property and invest vast sums of in marketing, and marketing is expensive through the portals or whatever medium you're using. If that gets you an outcome, then I don't think it really matters. But at the end of the day, you let the owners make the decision as to whether you want to appeal to a database and sell your property just to a database, which is a limited pool, or put it more broadly on the internet and open up to everybody. And that's the sort of collaborative advice-based approach that I take. So I don't think it's a trend. I think that's here to stay. Frequent's used as a listing tool. And that's some agents get their knickers in a twist about that. I don't see the big deal. You know, if you're sincere and you do have a buyer, you've got to be sincere and have a buyer. If you say someone, I've got a buyer in my database, you've got to have a buyer. You can't just... Tell them a porky pie. If you're working all the buyers and making sure you're capturing what their requirements are, then you've got a database that's ready to go. And that's a working process for me as well. I'm not amazing at it. I do pretty good at it. But I'm also always looking at best practice and sort of looking at who is really good at it because there's lots of people doing it who have been doing it much longer than I have and are better at it than I have. So, you know, that's sort of working inside the buyer pool and making sure you've got a really deep understanding of what their needs are is a, that's a constant evolution. So you mentioned that about databases, you mentioned in the beginning that your database started basically as a list of people that you wrote down and and then you sent them all a letter. Yeah. And there are some agents who are amazing at keeping razor clean databases and, and know exactly where everyone's at and then some not so much and some are new to the industry. What other ways did you grow your database in the beginning or what advice would you give to agents who are looking to build their database? What are some of the other ways that you would use? Through my corporate career, I I spent a lot of time working on my LinkedIn profile. But at the time, that was more to promote myself as a potential employee. Now I use it as a way to promote myself as a potential agent. And I've listed properties off LinkedIn where someone has contacted me and said, hey, Jace, we worked together five years ago. I've got a, a property that went to market a few weeks ago, didn't work. Could you come talk to me? And we ended up listing it and selling it. That was out of area. You know, my sweet spot sort of up in North Shore. That was in Castle Hill. But it was someone that I'd worked with who trusted me. So to come back to that, that trust concept, which is really talked about a lot everywhere in all through, all through business. But I think LinkedIn is a really great space, um, provided what you're posting on LinkedIn is relevant. 
and it's not just, hey, here's my new listing, because people don't give a rats about that. That's what real estate and domain are for. So if there's value to be had or where you're posting, I'll do a bit of, I've started doing the last few months doing more video on LinkedIn and I'm not doing it very in a very fancy way. I'd set up my phone in my car on a Saturday morning and, and record something for two or three minutes. And I put on LinkedIn, I put on Instagram, I put on Facebook and I push it out and I get some great responses on that. So that's a, that's a sort of a, that's real slow burn though. You know, so in terms of building a database, for me, that's been really successful, but probably the most hands-on proactive approach is really through open houses. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg there, but if you're less experienced in the industry and you're working in an office that's been open for more than two years, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to call, mm. hundreds that won't be worked in the database of yeah. people that came through open houses for property sold. And that includes my business. There's lots of people that we don't work properly and we're sport for choice. So if you're looking to work your database, I was taught work buyers, buyers become sellers or buyers know sellers, and eventually you'll find a transaction. That first property I mentioned that I sold in Roseville, I ended up listing three apartments in the one building in Epping, but I, I just got a little roll and that gave me a couple of bucks and sort of gave me a bit more confidence as well. So, you know, work hard and just look for wherever it is, but don't be a little bit unconventional and be willing to be patient too. That's really important, patient. Being patient is important. Yeah, it's often like, uh, you know, I hear all these stories all the time. It's, it's a bit like bamboo, you know, you, you plant bamboo and you see nothing for six years yep. and then all of a sudden it's nine foot tall. That's true. Yeah. yeah, that's really true. So in your first three years with Century 21, you ranked in the top 2% of more than 100,000 agents or something, some crazy number I read somewhere. In the final three years that you were there, you were placing the one, top 1% globally. Now, Century 21 is a massive organisation sure yeah. around the world. So obviously you went to being a top performer very, very quickly. What do you think some of the key aspects to that were? So some of the Century 21 systems were, were pretty good to me and I had some good mentors in there as well. That was probably instrumental. I think I've been fortunate too is that I'm a bit older. It's my birthday last week. So oh, happy I'm, birthday. Thank you. <laughs> I'm 49, but apparently 2020 doesn't count, so maybe it doesn't. So maybe I'm still 48. I'm not sure. 2020 has been <laughs> oh, such look, a horrid year. So. You don't look a day over fabulous to me, so <laughs> let's go with that. <laughs> let's have a drink later, Samantha. Thank you. I don't know. Like, I think I've been on the planet a long time. I've been on the planet longer, longer than others, so I think I've been fortunate. I just know more people, and I did have some really great corporate training. I, I was very fortunate. So I think, you know, I say frequently that a lot of the training that the banks invested in me is probably really paying off now. You know, when I was doing it, when I was like, 25 to 35, I was probably like, this is great. Why are we here? And it's only now through the fullness of time where I'm actually using some of those skills. But Century 21 was really good to me and I really enjoyed my time there. I learned a lot through other great operators. There's some amazing operators in Century 21 that probably, probably fly beneath the radar a little bit. And it's quite a collaborative network. But it's also, I guess it just gave me the confidence from a brand perspective in terms of taking that brand. So being a, new, a newbie and taking Century 21 to a listing presentation, everybody knew what you were. They knew you were a real estate agent. If I'd opened my own real estate agency, no one, no one has heard of me. So I think that was, pretty, um, that was pretty important. But I don't know, I think there's just talking to a lot of people, belly to belly. It's not all Instagram, it's not all Facebook, it's not all LinkedIn, it's belly to belly. Deals happen when a human is looking at a human, usually. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of looking at humans, we haven't done a lot of looking at humans this no. year, but, yeah. but let's just say, you know, for some of the younger agents that might be listening, when you're sitting in a vendor's lounge room giving a listing presentation or, or an appraisal or yep. some sort of a consultation, what are the things that you want the vendors to know about you and about your service? want them to know that I'm experienced. I've got a few grey hairs, probably more this year than, than other years, but I guess they want them to know that I'm experienced. But I'm probably more interested in knowing what their circumstances are, what is going on for them. So my first listing presentations, and even now still, I'll take questions on, I'll have the questions in front of me. So actual prompts, you know, I think don't be afraid to take cues to ask your vendor key questions. And there's tons of that information online or through different training systems. So make sure you're asking vendors about their circumstance. I mentioned earlier about looking over the vendor's shoulder and really knowing really what's going on and asking them what do they want to talk about. You know, why did you invite me in? Do you want to talk about price? Do you want to talk about fees? Do you want to talk about marketing? Do you want to talk about my recent sales? Ask them what they want to know of you. That's probably my approach. I'd also recommend they wear socks too. <laughs> I, I, me too, actually. There's a pair of socks for you out there with the lead agent on them. We, we give them to all of our podcast guests. 
It's interesting, actually. Like I've heard some agents now are ditching the flashy marketing materials for more of a let's sit down, pour the tea, what can I do for you? I'm more that kind of guy. Yeah. I'll take my marketing material, I'll take my presentations and I don't use digital media during, I mean, I might use my phone to show something, maybe to show a video or maybe to show a, a, an auction that we've run or something like that, but I don't use a lot of technology. I would just It's literally a conversation. But again, it depends on who, you, who your vendor is. You know, you've got to mirror what, what they want. If they want to talk using technology and using technology as, as part of the means of communicating, then that's what you need to adapt and mould to what your customer wants, not what you want to give them. So if someone ever offers me hospitality, be that a drink, a water, I don't take, I don't, I won't have a, a drink of like alcohol. You know, sometimes you'll be there on a Friday night or even a Saturday afternoon. Says, "Oh, Jace, do you want a beer?" I said, "I always say no. I might, I might be dying for a beer, yeah. but I just don't. I just, I just don't do it. I'm not sure why. It just, it just doesn't feel right. So, but if someone offers me hospitality of a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, I always say yes. It means that immediately if they're offering you that, there's a pretty good clue that they feel comfortable because they know that that conversation is probably going to take a bit longer. You must have done something pretty good to get to a point where they're offering you some sort of hospitality. Yeah. If they're, yeah. If and they're, don't eat. If they give you food, don't eat because I always make a mess. Yeah, no, me too. I'd, I always say no if there's any danger of, yeah. of, of that. Crumbling cookies out of your, falling out of your mouth as you're, and spitting as you're done. Not a good look. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm always wearing black too. <laughs> so it always shows up. Some of the things that lead to success for agents is having a, a great structured day. So what does the structure of your day look like? Like are you a 5 a.m. clubber or? No. 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 How do you? I'm I'm morning and afternoon. Morning I'm in the office. Afternoon I'm out of the office. That's about as structured as I get. I've got interests outside of real estate. That's called prospecting. But look, I try and follow a structure. I'm not a sit down. I don't do the sort of the block 45 minute call sessions. I sort of call people through the day, but mostly I sort of in the like I'm admin and sort of setting up appointments in the mornings and then afternoons. I'm trying to be out with people. That's on a daily basis. And then day by day, I'm more structured. You know, for example, I don't do photo shoots. So I, I still go to my photo shoots, for example, I, but I don't do them on a Monday because they're too busy after the weekend. I've got a rigid structure about when we go live, when we install furniture, when we install it. And not because I'm there, but it just sets up your week to be comfortable so you, you know, you can have a good run into Saturday rather than be stressing out on a four o'clock or five o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, running around trying to get stuff done where's my brochures for Friday to be ready for Saturday? I just, I, I hate that. But personally, I always carry a notebook. That's a big one for me, actually. I spent a few years in the Army Reserves. And if you didn't carry a notebook, you got your, your tail kicked. Yeah. So I just always carry a notebook. Even like a small one? or Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And not my phone, my no a notebook. Because I also figure if you go to see a client um, and you've got a notebook in your hand, you look ready. You look like you want to listen. And sometimes I might, I might make notes. If I've got a listening presentation, I always take a folder anyway. But even if it's a cup of coffee, I always take a notebook. And just even if you're writing notes, it doesn't matter what you're writing. They think you're talking about them. And that's the important thing. So that's a really active way of demonstrating that you're listening to what they're saying, I think. Yeah, definitely. So recently you made a swap over to the agency. I did. So, yeah. so talk to us about that move. Yeah. So I've known Matt LaHood. Everybody knows Matt LaHood. I've known Matt for many years from when I was in my banking career, when he was at McGrath. And I just stayed in contact with him, and that's one of the mentors that I referred to earlier. And I was probably just looking to freshen up my approach and just change a little bit of the structure I was operating. And Matt was offering some pretty interesting concepts that are actually reality. So some good ideas, but actually became reality. And I had a coffee with him in January of this year. And from that conversation, I was actually able to increase my fees. So, you know, I was, I'm, I've been list, I was listing stuff at a fee and apologizing for it. I'm now listing things at probably 20 or 30 basis points higher than that. And people aren't blinking. And I think to myself, man, I've left a lot of money on the table over the years. So it's sort of, he gave me some confidence. And then I was looking at the profile of the other agents that are within the agency. And there's some really heavy hitters in there. And as you said, success leaves clues. And I think that's a pretty good clue. So I joined great excitement and and left my previous brand with a, a bit of hesitation, quite a lot of hesitation actually, because I was stepping out of the comfort zone that I knew. But you know, I'm 
I think seven or eight weeks in now, and I can feel a shift in the in the dynamic for me personally, and it's just been wonderful. I'm really enjoying it. But maybe ask me again in six months' time. <laughs> well, you know, like we know Matt LaHood here quite well, and he's sure. been on the podcast a couple of times, and we yep. think he's a bit of a legend. So yeah, he is a lot of a legend. Look, we're rounding the corner of, from a very crazy year. What are some of the things you are hoping for for next year? What mm. are some of your goals? Personal goals. There's a target number that I've that I've set myself for. Actually, when I said that to Matt, he said, Jace, that's a bit soft, isn't it? And I'm like, oh, really? Not one of those managers again. So <laughs> not the Matt, not Matt's a manager. He's a believer in myself. So he's really been great. So I've got a, a hard number target of, I want to hit. And that's also sort of supported by a, a certain number of transactions. But actually through that, my personal goals, I actually want a bit more time for myself. I need to get more efficient at how I operate and perhaps rev the engine a little bit, not as hard because I'm in the right gear. So change gears be, and, and be ready to be um, doing 110 k's down the freeway in fifth gear or sixth gear rather than revving the engine at, in third gear and miss doing the same speed. Does that make sense? So, oh, I like that analogy, actually. You know, I, you I can, know exactly what you mean. The car will do yeah. 110 in third, but the engine will be roaring at you. And I've, some, some days this year I have felt a bit like that. So I've developed some interest outside of, of real estate. And I bought an old BMW motorbike and I want to work on that. It's 40 years old, 40 years this month, so oh, which, wow. ma- which makes me feel really old because I am. But, you know, just an interest outside of real estate, something to sort of a goal to work on something and I've sort of fallen in love with that. And yeah, so, but personally, I guess so my main goal is a bit more time for me. Yeah. My next question was going to be, you know, if you could ask the big fella for something, as in Santa, <laughs> to go in the red jacket, what would that be? Um, probably just to stay healthy, really. Yeah. You know, I'm in the sweet spot to get sick now. I think that's what everyone wants, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, stay, stay healthy. healthy. Yeah. That people, Australia continues to manage COVID really well. I don't really have many wishes. I don't know. If I, if I had a hard wish, a, a, a new bike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can't wish for a new guitar because I got one of those this year. Congratulations. I just, I just need more time to play it <laughs> like you. But look, it's been great having you in here. And thank you so much for coming in and sharing some of your knowledge and your tips and things like that. If there was one thing that you'd like to leave the audience with or one last piece of advice, what would it be? It's been a pleasure being here, Samantha. My one piece of advice would be be kind to yourself. If you miss a listing or you miss an appraisal or a buyer changes their mind and they're fickle because that's what they do, that's okay. There'll be another one. Don't beat yourself up. Be kind to yourself. Work hard, but be kind to yourself. Yeah, I think that's a great message at this time of year too, Jason. Jason Roach, thank you so much. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Elevate with thanks to connectnow.com.au. Don't forget to download your written action guide from this podcast containing extra tips, links and shortcuts. Visit eliteagentelevate.com.